Anjou Le Grand, I'm chairing this, uh, this session. It is actually the political quarterly uh, annual lecture sponsored by the LSE's Institute of Public Affairs. So I think political quarterly needs regular introduction. It simply presents the best analysis of public policy and politics in the UK and globally on a quarterly basis. And the fact I'm on the editorial board has got much to do with that statement. Um, it is also um, available, uh, if I can give a small plug, for £10 online uh, for an annual subscription. You get a book with this as well. Uh, the Institute of Public Affairs is a, is a new creation of the LSE. Um, uh, it uh, it's hosts its flagship, one of the flagship MBA programs, and aims to bring together politicians, policy makers, civil servants, both within the LSE uh, and uh, outside uh, to analyze and develop uh, public policy and sponsor events of this kind. Um, now, um, our speakers. Um, John Kay is one of the most distinguished uh, economists of his generation. He's a visiting professor here at the LSE. Uh, he's a fellow of St. John's College, Oxford, and he's a fellow of the British Academy. Uh, and he's director of several public companies and uh, is a columnist in the Financial Times. Um, uh, he's author of many books, including one of my favourites. Um, uh, it was very useful to me at the early stage of my career, The British Tax System, <laughs> along with Mervyn King. Uh, and his latest book, um, which I'm told with this permission will be pronounced obliquity. I was trying to, I was, I was toying with obliquity, but it's obliquity, um, is, was published in 2010. But today he's actually going to talk to us about the future of capitalism. He's not afraid of picking big topics to address. Um, he'll speak for about 45 minutes, um, and then he'll be followed by Mariano Mazzucato, uh, who will offer a few comments on it for about 10 minutes. Uh, Mariano is an economist and holding the R.C. Phillips Chair of Science and Technology at the uh, University of Sussex. Um, she's, she is also an author and has also just produced a book which I can give a straightforward plug to here, called The Entrepreneurial State, um, which uh, uh, so some very overturns some very interesting myths about, the, um, about state failure uh, and market success. Um, we will have time for a, a question and answer session, um, and then it will be followed by a reception, uh, and uh, I will tell you where the reception is uh, at the end of the session. But in the meantime, um, I'm delighted and indeed privileged to welcome John Kay and ask him to go scan. Thank you, Julian. The title is indeed The Future of Capitalism. It's also worth saying right at the beginning that uh, when I was asked to talk on the future of capitalism, I refused uh, for, for a variety of reasons, but I'll explain in a moment. I said if I was going to talk about that theme at all, I would rather talk about uh, the future of the market economy. But nevertheless, the organizers billed me as talking about the future of capitalism, whether I like it or not. Uh, so if anyone is only interested in hearing a lecture on the future of capitalism, there's a short opportunity to leave. <laughs> I noticed the chairman has instructions for actions in the event of public disorder in the course of the <laughs> So I hope they won't be necessary as a result of that warning. The reason I don't want to talk about the future of capitalism is that I think in thinking about modern business, the word capitalism is actually a misleading term which encourages misapprehension. There are a number of these misapprehensions. One of these is that economic power rests with the owners of capital. There was a time in the history of uh, the Industrial Revolution when people went to work in a place that had a sign saying, Arkwright's Mill. The modern offices and factories still have signs like that. They say Barclays or J.P. Morgan or they say something meaningless like Aviva or Tesco. <laughs> but these signs don't have the same meaning at all. In the Industrial Revolution, the mill was indeed 
Mr. Arkwright's about to be Sir Richard Arkwright's <laughs> mill. It belonged to Mr. Arkwright. Mr. Arkwright owned the plant and machinery with, within it. He uh, tolerated no insubordination, and because he owned it, people did what he says. But modern business isn't like that at all. If we think of who are the powerful economic and business figures today, we point to financiers like Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan, who of course once was a J.P. Morgan, but he is long dead, and Jamie Dimon is a very different individual and has a very different kind of financial interest. We point to central bankers like Bernanke or Draghi, business leaders like Steve Jobs, his successor at Apple, Tim Cook, Jeff Immel, CEO of General Electric. These are the powerful business figures of the world today. In no case does their economic power have anything to do with their ownership of capital. Their economic power arises as power almost always has from their position in a hierarchy, as it did in a church or a court historically. <coughs> they don't derive authority from their capital, Indeed, it's the other way around. They derive capital from the authority which they exercise. If I look at the Forbes rich list, I discover that the richest men in the world today are Carlos Slim, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. Gates and Buffett are not people who are politically powerful. World leaders indulge people like Gates and Buffett for their celebrity in rather the same way as they indulge Bono or the, the Dalai Lama. But that doesn't mean these people have political influence. Carlos Slim, the Latin American telecoms tycoon, who in the last Forbes rich, rich list was indeed the richest man in the world, he does have political influence. But he's rich because he has political influence, rather than having political influence. So economic power doesn't arise anymore from the ownership of capital in this sense. Then opponents of capitalism were always concerned about ownership of the means of production. For 100 years, the object of the British Labour Party was to transfer the mean ownership of the means of production to workers by hand or brain. There's not much point in spending time today discussing the ownership of the means of production. Ownership is another term which is simply unhelpful in talking about modern business. If you explain the concept of ownership to a visiting Martian, you explain to him what you mean when you say, I own my house, or Sir Richard Arkwright owned Arkwright's mill, and you then went to Apple or J.D. Morgan and asked who was the owner, your Martian would point to Jamie Dimon or Tim Cook. Nobody owns J.P. Morgan or Apple in any ordinary sense of the, of the term. I looked up who owns the Apple store on Regent Street, which many of you will have been in. The answer is it's 75% owned by the Queen and 25% owned by the Norwegian sovereign wealth. <laughs> I know that because I looked it up. I would be willing to bet that I could find very few people who either work in that shop or use that shop who know this fact. The ownership of who owns the means of exchange doesn't matter. And if you ask who owns the means of production of uh, what you buy in the Apple store, the answer is the main supply, the main manufacturers of Apple products are Foxconn, a Taiwanese company from its Chinese base, and Samsung, a Korean company. We don't know about the ownership of the means of production and exchange because it actually doesn't matter much anymore. It doesn't even make much sense to say that shareholders own shares. Last year I did an exercise, was commissioned to do an exercise by the British government on the structure of shareholding in the UK. When we did that, 
I discovered that if you ask, who are the owners of shares? Then you can pose at least four questions. One is, whose name is on the share register? You can ask another question, who decides whether to buy and sell a share? You can ask another question, who decides how the voting rights attached to the share should be exercised? And you can ask another question, which is who actually has the economic interest in a share? And you will discover that in Britain it's not only possible, but actually now normal, for all four of these characteristics of ownership to belong to different people. That is, a, there's a different <coughs> one person whose name is on the share register, there's another person who makes the buy and sell decisions, there's yet another agent <coughs> who uh, decides <coughs> how the share should be voted, and none of these people are the people who have the underlying economic benefit from the shares. The concept of ownership, in other words, simply gets in the way of intelligent thinking about the nature of modern business. And it obscures the proper economic analysis of the corporation uh, as a social institution. <coughs> and the final misconception is the idea that securities markets but what we often call capital markets. Certainly what <coughs> people in the city typically call capital markets are the means by which business obtains capital for investment. That is simply not true. Large companies in Britain, America, in all developed countries around the world are overwhelmingly self-financing. They generate more than sufficient funds for their operations to meet the totality of their investment needs. And small and medium-sized companies don't have, exercise, don't have access to capital markets. Increasingly, they don't have very much access to external means of finance at all. The days when if you developed a successful small and medium-sized business, your normal course of action was to float it have long gone. There are actually virtually no flotations of new British businesses on markets nowadays. There are, not, there are rather more, not very many, on the American Stock Exchange. <coughs> but when um, Facebook recently, uh, very unusually, raised 16 billion of new capital when they floated their shares in, in New York, they admitted rather disarmingly in their prospectus that they had no idea what they were going to do with the money. <laughs> Modern business, actually, is a lot less capital intensive than it used to be. And a, a successful modern business becomes cash generative, as Apple or Google or Facebook now are, at a much earlier stage in its life. Apple recently announced that it was raising a 17 billion, making a 17 billion pound bond this year. That's not because Apple needs the money. Apple needs the money probably less than any company in the world. In fact, certainly less than any company in the world. It has 150 billion pounds, an unbelievable sum actually, sitting on its balance sheets in overseas banks. The reason it raised the money is not that it needs the money, but it needs the money to pay dividends in the United States, and that money is actually located at banks overseas, and there would be a tax charge if the money were repatriated to the United States. This kind of activity is about financial engineering and has nothing at all to do with the operations of the company. And that is, in large part, what the relationship of large companies to capital markets today is about. So paradoxically, capital markets today are not a means of putting money into companies, they're actually a means of getting money out. And as we listen nightly to reports from the markets, as they're called, and defer to the people who earn the telephone and upper salaries for commanding these markets, we overstate greatly the economic significance of securities <coughs> markets, although we don't overestimate the influence that securities markets or the malfunctioning of securities markets is capable of having <coughs> what is going on in the real economy. So tonight I want to talk about the substance. I want to talk not about capitalism, 
about, but about the market economy. And when I talk about the market economy, the markets which I'm referring to are not the markets which you see reports of or on CNBC, they're the markets for goods and services. I'm going to define the market economy as an economic system which has two basic characteristics. One is that it makes extensive use of the price mechanism. And the other is it allows people, individuals, and businesses a great deal of freedom to establish new businesses, to develop new products, and to implement new business models. And these are the two characteristics which I'm going to emphasize as the key features of a market economy. Making a lot of use of the price mechanism and allowing a great deal of freedom in the establishment and operation of business. I'm also going to make the claim that there are really no successful economic examples of sustained and successful economic development in societies which haven't adopted something that could be, in the terms I've described it, represented as a market economy. And indeed, that all the countries that are today close to what we might think of as the technological frontier that are producing the amounts of goods and services which the, with the efficiency which we know is possible given modern technology and modern business methods, the country, countries that are at that technological frontier are essentially all in one version or another market economies. Now that's a set of claims that is in a sense both a strong set and a weak set. It's a strong claim in that I'm making a powerful assertion of the superiority of market organization over other systems of resource allocation. But it's also a weak claim in that it doesn't involve any assertion that markets give rise to efficient outcomes in any particular case or taken as a whole. And it's certainly a long way short of any claim what emerges from the operation of a market system is equitable or in any other way morally justified. So this is kind of what Ian Forster, who talked about two cheers for democracy, might have described as two cheers for a market system. Or Winston Churchill made a kind of similar remark when he supposedly said that democracy was the worst form of uh, political organization except for all the others that anyone had tried. <coughs> that is about the strength of the claim that I want to make for the market economy. Not that it is something which can be presumptively efficient in its outcomes, far less that it's justified in its outcomes, but that on balance it seems to work better than other systems of resource allocation which have been tried. And if we're to if we're to believe that claim, I think we need to analyze and understand a bit about why. There are three parts to that explanation, I think. The first is the role that prices serve in a market system in providing signals. And those of you who have done Economics 101, or perhaps Economics 201, when you get to general equilibrium kind of uh, analysis, will have encountered rather poorly that idea that prices act as a signaling mechanism. And that means that the price mechanism enables fairly good decisions to be made about coordination of resource allocation without it being necessary to either process or obtain very large amounts of information. That is, it's the informational efficiency of prices as a signaling that is this feature of the market economy. Some of you may have heard the perhaps apocryphal story of the, uh, the Russian planner who after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Empire uh, went to New York to see how capitalism and the market economy worked and after a bit asked, so who is in charge of the supply of bread to New York? And of course, the paradoxical answer is not just that no one is in charge of the supply of bread to New York, but actually that with no one in charge of that supply, 
it's actually better and more reliably organized than it was in a city like Moscow where somebody is in charge. Coordination actually seems to be better accomplished without having someone who has the role of coordinator. And that's something that when one thinks, stands back and thinks about it is so extraordinary that most people actually don't even notice it. It's just something we take for granted about life in a market economy. There's also a converse to that, which is that some, people, some of the people who do notice it then start seeing the virtues of uh, the market with the kind of dangerously uncritical voices that are uh, heard from people who, stew, who, who, who accept all kinds of fundamentals. So the market achieves this problem of coordination relatively, relatively painlessly and with this great informational efficiency. And that mere mechanism of information <coughs> handling is, I think, complex and intriguing and it justifies at least some of the time students spend on it in Economics 201. But I also suspect that students who only do Economics 101 and 201, and perhaps students who do any kind of economic degree, uh, spend too much time on that particular part of the story of how market economy operates, and too little on other characteristics of the market economy. And the two other characteristics of the market economy I want to talk about are markets as a process of experiment and discovery, and the way in which markets check rent-seeking through decentralizing economic power. I want to say a bit about each of these. Let me start with markets as a process of experiment and discovery. The world we live in is uncertain, and I mean uncertain, I mean uncertain rather than risky, in the sense in which uncertainty was distinguished from risk by people who wrote about these issues the best part of a century ago, like Keynes and Frank Knight. Uncertainty means not, not just that we don't know what the future will hold. It means that we're unable to specify with any precision what the range of possible outcomes across that future actually is. If we could predict, you cannot predict or anticipate the invention of the wheel, because if you were to predict the invention of the wheel, you would already have invented it. That's what was meant by this kind of radical and fundamental uncertainty. And it's a kind of radical and fundamental uncertainty which is not capable of being handled with probabilistic reason. So now, market economies uh, don't predict the future. What market economies do is they explore it. And centralized systems, whether they're state or corporate bureaucracies, manage that changing future badly because they typically experiment too little. Committees find reasons why any new proposal will fail. And anyone, there are many of you, the, you, you in this room who sit or sat on either political committees or university committees will have ample experience of that. It is never difficult to think up reasons why any new proposal will fail. And mostly these reasons are right because new proposals mostly do <coughs> fail. Most experiments <coughs> in business don't succeed. That means that market economists thrive on a continued supply of unreasonable optimism. And when the innovations of these optimists occasionally succeed, the innovations involved are quickly imitated. And that's true for innovations that are commercially successful as well. There are many innovations that are commercially successful that are not commercially successful for the people who innovate. The first personal computer and the graphical user interface, which was critical in making computers accessible to everyone, both these things were produced at the research labs of the Xerox Corporation and Xerox Park. <coughs> Has anyone here ever used a Xerox computer? Apple is the world. 
world's most valuable company today. I've already talked about it a bit. It's a company that came close to bankruptcy twice in the last 30 years, and it sacked its founding genius before, a few years later, it reinstated it. I remember the first personal computer I ever used. It was manufactured by a company called Sirius, which, as a matter of fact, it was a subsidiary of Exxon, rather curiously. We all of us use tablets nowadays. The tablets and the tablets now are the focus of innovation in the computer sector. The tablet has been invented kind of a dozen times over the last 20 years, and it almost always failed until eventually it succeeded with a particular version that happened to have the facilities that were uh, ideally suited to it and that appeared at a particular <coughs> time when other developments in the computer industry made that a successful innovation. Nobody got the future of that industry right. And the personal computer revolution happened essentially in a similar way to the effective supply of bread in New York, it happened because nobody were, was in charge of it. And the vast majority of the products which people launched in the course of the personal computer revolution actually failed. There wasn't a similar revolution in, in the Soviet Union, except to the extent that uh, the Soviet Union simply bought and innovated Western products. And that was because some people were in charge of the supply of computers to New York, uh, to Moscow. And the similar computer revolution didn't really happen within IBM for essentially the same reason. IBM was for two decades overwhelmingly the dominant computer company in the world. Now it did sort of happen. And it happened in IBM in a very interesting way, that in 1980, the chief executive of IBM at the time fed up with the fact that nothing happened in the way of producing personal computers in IBM, set up a completely off-site operation to develop a personal computer within the company. And because it was an off-site operation, it meant they had to buy in all the parts that made the computer work, so they went out and bought chips from Intel, they went out and bought software from, from Microsoft, and so on, and that was how it was that IBM, in a sense, created the personal computer revolution, but actually gave most of the benefit of that creation to these companies, Intel and Microsoft. And actually, the people on the bureauc in the bureaucracy of IBM who resisted through the 1970s the development of personal computers within IBM because they thought that the development of personal computers would destroy IBM's market position. They were, in the long run, proved to be absolutely right. The reasons people wanted to stop the innovation turned out to be valid, uh, and it's for the benefit of the world, they're not the benefit but they were not in the end successful. So market economies are better than planned societies at the origination and diffusion of new ideas, but they're also better at disposing of failed ideas. Anyone who's ever worked in a large bureaucracy, whether public or private, knows that in such an organization, honest feedback is very rarely welcome. In authoritarian societies, it can be literally fatal. In less intimidating societies, uh, unwanted messages can be fatal to careers. Uh, there's a famous incident when, after the the fall of uh, the uh, after the, the death of Stalin and the beginnings of opening up of the Soviet Union. Khrushchev went on his first visit to the United States. And he was taken to see a supermarket and uh, was not greatly impressed by the supermarket because he knew that all the stock shelves on the supermarket would have been specially stocked for his arrival. 
as indeed they would have been if the President of the United States had gone to visit the Soviet Union. But he was truly impressed when he went to Iowa and saw the flowing fields of maize. You couldn't fake the endlessly flowing fields of maize. So he went back to Moscow convinced that one of the secrets of American economic success was maize. <laughs> this uh, chimed with Khrushchev's own experience because as a young agricultural bureaucrat in, in Russia, he had been responsible for some experimental development of maize. So Khrushchev ordered a large-scale conversion of wheat growing areas to maize. And actually, there were good reasons why maize, why wheat was more suitable as a crop in large areas of the Soviet Union than the maize was. And the maize was not very successful. But that wasn't uh, what Khrushchev and the, and the Politburo were told. Indeed, in one famous phrase produced by one of the acolytes, under socialism, he said, maize can be grown anywhere. <laughs> and unfortunately, even under socialism, maize couldn't be grown everywhere. The result was not only, firstly, that the experiment was tried on far too large a scale, it was a perfectly sensible idea to convert some uh, crop growing land in the Soviet Union to maize and see how it worked. It would also have been sensible to have stopped when it didn't work. But neither of these things actually happened. And what did happen actually was that there was a major agricultural setback in the Soviet Union, and that proved in the end to be one of the reasons why Khrushchev was ultimately ultimately to So the health of the market economy depends essentially on constant replenishment of the business sector by new entry. If as a planner or a sponsoring department you've been forecasting the future of the computer industry in, in the 1970s, you, we certainly wouldn't have gone to Bill Gates or Paul Allen or Sir <coughs> Steve Jobs. If as planning or sponsoring department you've been looking at the, uh, the, the future of aviation, you wouldn't have gone to talk to Stellius and soon to be an easy jet. You certainly wouldn't have gone, gone to talk to Michael Leary of Ryanair. The people you would have talked to would have been the people who were running IBM and the people who were running British Airways. And these are indeed the people sit on the analogous committees nowadays. <coughs> you'd oppose the answers to these you'd oppose these questions to men in suits like yourself. Truth is that nobody knew who were the people who would shape the future of these industries was. These people didn't know themselves at the time. And it's only with hindsight that we know both what the business models that shape, reshape these industries were and the individuals who were uh, responsible for devising these, uh, these business models. So the second element in understanding the, the success of the market economy is the way in which it allows this process of experiment and discovery. My third heading is going to be diffusion of political the point here is that prosperity and growth in modern economies depend on focusing entrepreneurial energy uh, on the creation of wealth rather than the appropriation of wealth which has been created by other people. What economists call rent-seeking is the process by which ambitious individuals find it more rewarding to batten on wealth created by other people than to create it themselves. And rent-seeking of this kind takes a whole variety of forms. You can have the castles in the Rhine, on the Rhine. If you travel up the Rhine, that's its narrow point between, uh, between Cologne and Bingen, you will see on each bank the castles which people built when the Rhine 
was a major European highway, the castles which people built in order to extract tolls from everyone who passed. That's one form of rent seeking. 10% commissions on art sale or on, on arms sales, or 7% commissions on new issues of shares in the London Stock Exchange is another uh, form of rent seeking. Awarding control to yourself over formerly state-owned assets, stealing the revenues from your country's mineral deposits, seeking protection from foreign competition, blocking market access by new entrants, winning sinecures or overpaid positions in the public sector by ingratiating yourself with public servants or politicians. <coughs> These are all the characteristic mechanisms of rent seeking. In, in the economies we have. And the methods you engage, you engage in range from armed force, the guys of the castles of the Rhine, to victory in democratic elections that enables you to take control of the, uh, of the resources of the country for the benefit of yourself and your cronies. In more sophisticated societies, the methods range from lobbying on Capitol Hill to entertaining people in the restaurants of Brussels. Now, this kind of rent-seeking is essentially ineradicable. All societies suffer from it, but we can have more of it or less. And politics used to be dominated in our prosperous Western societies by rent-seeking activities, factions that would battle for control of the state, and when they won it, would use it to, keep, to help themselves to as much as they could get their hands on. <coughs> and much of the world is like that still today. The ability of an economic system to resist rents depends on the degree of centralization. And wherever there are concentrations of economic power, individuals will try to appropriate the rents that are derived from them, whether these concentrations are in the private or the public sector. <coughs> A properly functioning market economy is one which, by breaking down concentrations of economic power and encouraging a flow of constant new entry, actually presents real obstacles to rent-seeking activities. I'll come back to how successful we are today in actually blocking this kind of activity in the countries in which we live. But the central theme that runs through everything I've said so far about the strengths of the market economy is the power of what I describe as disciplined pluralism. By pluralism, I mean that there's a great deal of freedom to experiment with the provision of new goods and services, new methods of production, new business organization. While the discipline implies that there's a reasonably rigorous process of discontinuing unsuccessful production or organization, and that the, the decentralized decisions of businesses and consumers play a large role in both facilitating pluralism and imposing discipline. And it won't have escaped your attention, I think, that if one, one is emphasizing discipline and pluralism as the strength of a market economy, there's a rather clear association between economic pluralism in this sense and political pluralism. It's not necessarily impossible to maintain this kind of economic dynamism in an authoritarian society, but it's quite hard to have one kind of pluralism without the other. So I've talked about the virtues of a market economy in terms of three basic criteria. The management of information flows, the capacity to experiment, and the ability of decentralization to check rents. I want you at the same time to notice some things I've not said. I've talked about the strengths of a market economy without saying that greed is a good thing or an overwhelmingly strong human motivation. I haven't told you that business people are a lot smarter than bureaucrats. I think if you've had as much experience as business people as I have, you would find it quite difficult to, to, to continue in that belief. I haven't told you that government interference with the operation of free markets is misconceived or evil. 
I haven't told you that Goldman Sachs is doing God's work, <laughs> and I don't personally believe any of these things. I do, however, believe that governments are generally quite bad at running supermarkets or inventing personal computers, and I hope I've given you some part of the explanation of why I actually think that. The basic reason is that no one, whether they're business people or politicians, is much good at predicting the future. The range of goods we find in supermarkets, the electronic gadgets we carry in our bags or our pockets, these things evolve through a process of endless small-scale experiments, most of them unsuccessful, and that particular mechanism of progress sits very uneasily with political decision-making or collective decision-making or centralized decision-making. So the market economy, as I've been describing it, is very different from a concept of free markets that applauds the aggressive pursuit of self-interest and opposes any restriction on the exercise of that self-interest. And in truth, that kind of unrestricted scope for personal opportunism is an economic system which, like socialism, has not proved very successful anywhere it's been tried and the countries which persist in that kind of unrestricted opportunism are countries like Nigeria and Haiti, which suffer from endemic spread seeking and are actually among the poorest on the planet. So there are many kinds of market economy that meet the criteria I've described <coughs> of having a substantial role for prices on the one hand, and a good deal of freedom to implement new products and means of business organization on the other. United States, Sweden, Japan, perhaps now China, all of them very different. And all of them are governed by elaborate regulatory codes, which are derived both from law and from social institutions. Successful market economies are socially embedded. Successful market economies accommodate complex and multifaceted goals from individuals who mostly don't conform to stereotypes of rational economic man. Successful market economies function in an environment that is characterized by radical uncertainty. It's not just that we don't know what's going to happen, we don't even know the kinds of things that are going to happen. Successful market economies protect property rights, but the property rights that they protect are social constructions, not things that are determined by, by nature. Successful market economies require a lot more cooperation than purely contractual relationships between individuals would, would permit. Successful market economies produce complex goods and services which can only be traded safely in a context characterized by trust relationships and emphasis on reputation. And in successful market economies, most of the risks of everyday life are managed not through market institutions, but through, um, but, but, but through social ones. I've described how I think a market economy works. And I've described how a market economy works in a way that both the traditional socialist critique of markets and the modern espousal of market fundamentals actually fail to describe. In a sense, we have an intellectual vacuum that needs to be properly filled. And the existence of that intellectual vacuum was, I think, very evident when the banking system around the world collapsed in 2008. The political left with no real ideas or analytic framework coherently able to deal with this problem, acquiesced readily in the process by which governments provided much of the capital and underwrote all of the liabilities of the major banks <coughs> of the world. Paradoxical left-wing governments was that having left-wing parties having for a century waited for capitalism to collapse under its own contradiction were so uh, scared by the prospect this might actually happen on their watch <laughs> that the only recourse they could think of 
was to shovel very large amounts of money the way of the capitalists. <laughs> and faced in Britain with an uh, environment that was for, with a party that was frightened of the very word nationalization, okay. far less rea its reality. The Labour government here wouldn't countenance even discussion of the issue of nationalizing the banks, even though the moment was one at which many people on the political right, as well as the political left, could easily have been persuaded that this was a moment at which nationalization would have permitted the reconstruction of the financial system, which was the right response to the events of 2008. Simply writing large checks saved thought, and it avoided a confrontation for which politicians, both uh, pragmatically and intellectually, were completely unprepared. The statement today that there should be more regulation is a hopelessly inadequate response to the problems which the financial sector poses for the real economy. There is no point in asking for more regulation unless we're clear not just about the outcomes that regulators seek, but about the mechanisms by which these outcomes might actually be achieved. We don't create financial stability by appointing a body whose responsibility is to oversee financial stability. But a lot of people seem to think that that's the case. And despite the extraordinary evidence of the comprehensive past failure of financial services regulation, we continue to have wildly exaggerated explanations of what regulation might actually achieve. CEOs and boards of large financial institutions, people who are paid telephone number salaries, were unable to understand or control what was going on in, within their organizations. And yet we now imagine that rather modestly paid employees of regulatory agencies are going to be able to do that. It's not that regulators lack relevant power, the reality <coughs> is that regulators lacked political authority and technical competence to undertake the impossible job with which they were charged. It was to supervise the strategy and conduct of large financial conglomerates which were characterized by large-scale, excessive financial, excessive political influence, and a complexity which was not fathomable even to the people who were supposed to be in charge of Rome. And that reality has not changed one bit since 2008, and it's not going to change either. So what we need to do is to address issues of structure rather than attempt to monitor behavior. Stabilizing the structure of the financial services sector was exactly the right thing to do as an urgent response in 2008, <coughs> And it was exactly the wrong thing to do uh, in the long run, because it was actually <coughs> the structure as it had evolved the financial services industry that had given rise to the problems. Instead of facilitating the orderly winding down of institutions that would fail, we committed large amounts of public money to their indefinite continuation. <coughs> so we need to think about policies in quite a different way. We need to think about policies not in terms of broad generalizations about market failure <coughs> or about the virtues of market fundamentalism or the need for more regulation. Public policy needs to be based on a pragmatic and specific understanding of the specifics of market activities. And there's nowhere where we need to start that more urgently than in the financial sector. The policies we need to adopt need to be policies that are pro-market, but not pro-business. And we fail to understand that distinction. That's clearest in the financial sector, where we've, failed, we've confused the health of the financial services industry with the health of individual firms in the financial services sector. And that's something which we're now doing repeatedly in terms of the failure of our structures to check rent seeking, 
to emphasize that we want to be pro-market, which is not at all the same. In many contexts, it's the opposite as being pro the interest of established business. But we make, we make this mistake today in our policies in business, in sector after sector. The financial sector is the worst instance of it, but I, I shall list simply two others. One is pharmaceuticals, where we sustain a business model which worked well for two decades, producing rather successfully a batch of drugs that effectively treat but do not cure the chronic illnesses of rich people, like depression, stomach ulcers, hypertension, obesity, etc., but are inadequate for the kind of new challenges which uh, the continuing development of the underlying technology of pharmacology makes possible. Another area where we protect uh, the, the, the existence of established firms rather than facilitating the development of the market is in print media, where the digital economy can make, has the capacity to transform the way in which we both receive news and allocate uh, uh, and gain access to both historic and new printed material. And yet our policy is very much designed around maintaining the vested interests of publishing firms, which in their existing form have very little role to play in a digital future. One could go on proliferating these examples, but I'm running out of time, I could not intend to do so tonight. I simply want to reiterate that we are in case after case confusing policies that are pro-market policies that are pro-business and protecting the established interests of existing firms at the expense of the innovation and discipline pluralism, which is the characteristic of an effectively functioning market economy. So I began with a critique of the term capitalism, which I think is unhelpful in thinking about the problems which we now face. It's particularly unhelpful because the allocation of capital and the operation of securities markets really no longer plays a central role in yeah. modern economic development. And that means we're having our policies dominated and dictated by what happens in the financial sector to an inappropriate extent and one which means we're unable to tackle the worst problems of vested interest rent-seeking which currently exists. That's why I want to insist on talking about the market economy rather than capitalism, and to emphasize that when I talk about the market economy, I'm talking about an economy based on markets and goods and services, not on markets in derivative securities. So the strength of markets and the market economy lies in this discipline pluralism. The ability to experiment and a structure that shuts down experiment when it, when it fails. And that's important in economics as it is important in politics and in intellectual life. We need to understand that the market system is not some well-oiled physical machine, but a constantly <coughs> adapting and rather imperfect biological system. Pluralism is the motive force of markets. The essence of a properly functioning market system is chaotic, its development is inherently uncertain. If we could predict the development of markets, we wouldn't actually need markets in the first place. And perhaps in that means there's a certain hubris in taking as a title the future of the market economy. And I should have stuck with the future of capitalism. <laughs> Said, but I'm unfortunately going to finish off, and in some ways, even the first thing I'm going to say is to disagree with some of the essence. Um, I believe markets are outcomes. Uh, value is not created in markets, it's actually created in organizations. So I think we have to be pro organization, which doesn't mean pro business, not pro market. And again, by the market, I mean the outcome. Now, which organizations? I'll talk in, let me just make sure I speak only 10 minutes. 
um, different types of organizations. These are business organizations, government organizations, <coughs> um, household organizations, okay? And the real problem, I think, is that by talking about different things, which you know, John has also talked about in, in other work, for example, his wonderful work he's done um, for government on looking at the problems with uh, short-termism in the financial sector. In the end, what we're often talking about is value extraction being rewarded over value creation. But unless you have a theory of where that value comes from, it's gonna be really hard to really talk about things like rent seeking in any meaningful way, okay? So I think what I wanna to bring to this discussion is where does value actually come from, through which then we can talk about these problems about rent seeking, about value extraction, and about what the role of policy is to actually stimulate things like innovation, which I was very happy to hear were such a central part of the talk. So let me just start by actually agreeing with a key point, which is, you know, markets, if you just think about the critique that is often made about short-termism, it's somehow that the markets are forcing these companies to be short-termist. And the you know, first point that John raises in the paper, in the talk, which is also a great paper, is that you know, there's a difference between um, you know, just talking about markets and actually talking about the power, the hierarchy, the authority within these markets. So for example, one of the real problems today, which again, John has talked about in some other things he's written, for example, the, the amount of money that companies are spending just on buying back their own shares through this repurchase schemes, which Apple, by the way, just you know, um, embarked on a 50 billion one, there's no market that's telling companies to do that. In fact, some companies don't do that. Apple, until recently, didn't buy back its stock. Um, Ericsson in, you know, doesn't do that. Cisco does, and on a massive scale. So there's choices within these companies that are made in how to react to very large shareholder pressure, if you want. So it's not small shareholders, it's the very large ones that in fact, where we can see some of these pressures that people talk about the market. <coughs> David Einhorn uh, uh, supposedly was one of the key forces uh, behind Apple's decision recently to you know, engage in this massive buyback strategy. And by the way, buybacks are huge, okay? So $3 trillion have just been spent in the last decade in companies buying back their stock just amongst 400 of, of, of the top 500, 400, 500 companies. Many companies that we think are really innovative, so Pfizer, Amgen, actually spend more money on repurchasing their stock, which, which to me is just a proxy for value extraction type practices, than on the R&D process, okay? And this is in a sector, pharmaceuticals, that is considered to be one of the most innovative, you know, high R&D intensity sectors. Um, so the problem, of course, is if they were doing that and also reinvesting in the processes that create the innovation that John was talking about, fine. Instead, in some research that we've just been doing through a project that I coordinated called FinOff, Finance, Innovation, and Growth, and some work that Bill Azonic especially has been doing, we find that these buyback schemes are especially hurting the reinvestment that these companies then are making into the innovation process. So that's where it matters, right? If you can actually prove that these value extraction practices are hurting their investments in human capital and R&D, et cetera. But I don't really wanna to talk too much about that. I just wanna say that that's an example of value extraction and in some ways also rent-seeking behavior, um, which then one really has to engage with it first though, saying, well, where the hell does value even come from in the first place? If you're gonna start talking about those practices as problematic because they are extracting value. And so here I want to sort of go to my first point, which is that value comes from organizations. Okay, so, um, and you know, I think underlying some of what you were talking about was that these organizations interact collectively. You know, there's this really trendy word nowadays called open innovation, and so you know, you have all these different types of organizations, different types of public sector organizations, different types of private sector organizations interacting to such a degree, by the way, that some of the big companies have even decided just to stop even spending in R&D. So some of the big uh, pharmaceutical companies have shut down their R&D labs, you know, openly saying, you know, we actually get most of our innovations anyway from the small biotech companies, from the um, uh, public big labs like NIH. So what we really are in some ways are knowledge brokers. We of course spend a lot of money on things like development of the R&D, but we don't necessarily have to be doing the R&D labs ourselves. And this is talked about in this very positive way as you know, a result of the open innovation system. Um, but the truth there, of course, is that it, there is this very collective process. And I just want to focus on what the state does in that collective process, because we heard lots here about, you know, that the PC revolution would not have occurred had it been centralized, had some big planner actually been planning 
what to do in this system. And in fact, most of what I've been trying to argue recently through not just the book, but also a lot of policy work that I do is we actually have no clue what the state does. You know, both because of what you mentioned and you actually highlight very well in the paper, again, is that we keep talking about the state kind of coming in and just fixing markets, but not only that. Um, what the state has done in places like Silicon Valley, as part of this collective um, ecosystem, if you want, is done so much more than just, say, funding the research, you know, the, the basic research upstream, which is usually justified precisely through this market failure approach. It has also done a huge amount of applied research. It has even done the seed finance. So, so much of the early stage money, which of course is a really you know, high risk, difficult money for companies to get, actually first comes from the state and only later does venture capital come in. And I just can't, uh, how do you say, not to tell the story because you kept telling these stories about Khrushchev, you know, trying to learn things from the US. Well, there's this wonderful story where Mitterrand, French, uh, comes to the US because he really wants to import basically Silicon Valley to um, France. So he gets on this tour, and I think on the tour there was um, the Genentech VC uh, Perkins, of uh, Kleiner Perkins, and Paul Berg, who's uh, won the Chemistry Nobel Prize, I can't remember what year, and some other people. And you can imagine who was doing all the talking, right? The VC guy, and we did this, we did that, we did this. And all of a sudden, uh, supposedly, this is a story that was told in the Washington Post, um, Paul Berg, the Nobel Prize chemist, is like, what the hell are you talking about? Where were you guys, VC, when we really needed you? In other words, VC often comes in late in the game in biotech and nanotech and clean technology. Today, they've come in sort of 15 to 20 years after the massive state investments in this process. And again, this is not just about basic research. It was interesting that Romney, when he was on the election trail, he said, the first thing I'm gonna do if I become president is cut all the applied research of ARPA-E, Mm. which is basically trying to do for green what DARPA did for the internet because of this notion that somehow the state should just be kind of doing the boring stuff, just like some of the attackers today of the BBC think that the BBC should just be doing you know, boring documentaries on giraffes, which as we all know would be basically kill the BBC. Um, and so, you know, talking about the gadgets that you said everyone has in their pockets, I assume most of you have an iPhone, probably in your pocket, every single technology that makes the iPhone smart and not stupid was funded by the state. You know, internet by DARPA, GPS, touchscreen display, even this new thing that I was pressed by accident, this Siri voice activated thing. You can ask it if God exists, all funded by the state. So what do you need? You need someone like Steve Jobs to have taken his wonderful calligraphy classes and to come around and, you know, and put it all together in a funky way. Yes, it's very important and we don't have enough of those people. Really, actually, not enough people take probably calligraphy <coughs> classes, but we don't have enough of these geniuses. He was a genius. But it's crazy to think, which is what Europe thinks, and I work a lot with the commission, that what we're missing in Europe is VC. What we're missing in Europe is especially this massive wave, which VC surfed. And they surfed it because, you know, they were in California. But, um, and so much of European commission policy today is about somehow, you know, this Death Valley problem, this commercialization problem, VC problem, without realizing that VC on its own creates nothing, and Steve Jobs' great lecture to the Stanford graduating class, you know, stay hungry, stay foolish. Well, guess what? If you're gonna be foolish in many countries in Europe where you don't have massive state funding, you will remain <coughs> foolish. You, know, you will not actually <laughs> be producing the kind of apples of this world. Now, let me just finish, because I'm sure I'm, I probably have two, only two more minutes. Um, what does this mean? So, you know, one of, um, Polanyi's, you know, Carl Polanyi is actually one of the people who really theorized what the market, what is the state, and he had this whole thing about, you know, markets have actually been around forever. There's nothing specific to capitalism about markets. There was local markets and international markets that have existed since the Egyptians. What's very specific about capitalism is this notion of the national market, and that's also very recent. In this book he wrote on the Great Transformation, he really argued that that national market, which we actually all mean today when we talk about the market, was very much almost imposed by the state. So that this sort of state market, you know, dichotomy that many of us have in our heads from day one is a false dichotomy. But even more so in the innovation economy, the knowledge economy of today, all these examples that I just gave you of the state actually funding so much of the entrepreneurial part, which I define as a high risk, high uncertainty part, it's easy to come in later, um, was done by the state. But you know, this is kind of old fashioned talking sometimes. The state is the courageous one, private sector is kind of Parasitic. That's not what I'm saying. 
I'm saying what modern capitalism about is public-private partnerships increasingly. It's true we have this open innovation system, but guess what? Unless you have an idea, a theory of what it is, of what that public sector is bringing to those public-private partnerships, you're probably gonna set them up quite badly. And, and unfortunately, the one thing I sort of didn't like or not that I didn't like, but that I didn't agree with in the speech was this resonance of this kind of old way to think about the state as a centralized, bureaucratic, kind of gray organization, and then these you know, entrepreneurial self-discovery uncertainty um, somehow being better fostered by the market. Um, I mean, what we really have today, what's problematic today is that these ecosystems, you know, these public-private partnerships, are increasingly not symbiotic, right? I mean, ecosystems can either be symbiotic or parasitic, kind of predator preyish. And what we need is real, you know, better indicators of how to distinguish those two things. So the fact that these companies that are benefiting so much, like Apple, all the technologies behind the iPhone, and even the early seed finance they received, the first 500K came from government uh, seed capital through the SBIC program, and yet then they pay so little tax and don't even have as, you know, the, equivalent, the equivalent of the Xerox labs. Apple doesn't fund those big labs. We used to have these public-private partnerships. There's nothing new about that term, but there, it was much more symbiotic. Xerox Park, Bell Labs, they were, you know, the private sector also putting a lot of money into this partnership. And as you say, innovation is an uncertain process, and Xerox Park didn't necessarily benefit as much as it potentially could have. But, we ha but what we have today is a very unequal type of partnership, and unfortunately, government <coughs> is sort of feeding the system this whole notion that somehow finance is bad, real economy is good, so let's do industrial strategy. So much of what they're doing is actually just feeding what the problem is, which is the ultra-financialized real economy. As you know, the examples of the share buybacks are just one, or the amount of emphasis that VC is giving just to the exit stage. That I thought was a really good point too, that these equity markets are being just focused on in terms of exit, not really in terms of funding the innovation system. But just lastly, you know, when we look at these specific agencies within government, around the world, it used to be the US, but unfortunately the US, because of political problems, is underfunding its own successful system. So the NSF funded Google's algorithm that was state funded, but the NSF today is bankrupt because of this whole sort of Tea Party type politics. Um, if you look at those particular organizations, they were kind of crazy. DARPA, you walk into DARPA or ARPA E today, you kind of feel like you are in Googles, people wearing shorts and sandals and being kind of crazy, but they actually thought about that. What can we do within this state public organization to make it welcome failure, to make it want to explore? There's nothing about the DNA of the public sector that's gonna make it less able to be explorative. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more you think of the state as potentially just kind of centralized, bureaucratic, gray, inertial, or as the, as the economist always talks about, the Leviathan, the more, that's what it's gonna be. Go to BNDS today in Brazil. I see Robert Wade is here. Robert and I were just there in the bank itself. They have a vision for what they wanna do. It's a big state investment bank. It's very bureaucratic. They even have an elevator, which is for the president, the vice president, an elevator for the directors, an elevator for the lower people. So at first, like, oh my God, how is this place ever gonna be innovative? But they have a mission and a vision within a country that really wants to achieve this smart, inclusive, kind of sustainable growth. They're investing hugely in innovation. The vice president got a PhD at SPRU. I'm at SPRU because it's the place at Sussex, the international place to think about innovation. They make 21% return on equity in these investments. It's a very successful investment bank that is investing in innovation and the kind of things that you say are very important in modern capitalism. The first thing that people worry about here when they said let's you know, nationalize RBS and turn it into a state investment bank was oh, those bureaucrats, they're never gonna be able to make the right decisions. Well you can bet that if they did nationalize it and with that kind of attitude they probably would have you know, attracted those kind of bureaucrats. You need, you know, there is this self-fulfilling prophecy in countries that talk about the state in such a problematic way of the kind of people even then, you know, potentially even attracted to work in that state. And just lastly, the real problem, as we know, in capitalism is inequality. Um, and this is not about skills. Of course, skills are a problem. There is this skill biasness with new technological revolutions, but that does not explain, skills do not explain the 1% and the 99%. What does explain that is the fact that you do have these huge amounts of value extraction policies that are being rewarded over value creation ones. And the fact that you know, innovation is so cumulative 
It builds today on what happened before. Think of it as a curve, a cumulative distribution curve, so not a Gaussian process, not a random walk. If you come in late, as I just said VC does, and these are usually described as the good finance, right, versus the head funds, and the whole share buyback thing that I mentioned is just a proxy, if policy is allowing you to, you can actually capture the entire integral under that curve, okay? So, but that requires a theory of where innovation comes from. And just to say, just to, you know, the, the, the punchline is you cannot talk about rent seeking without first telling me where that value came from. And I find it really problematic how the state, when we talk about it, is always just in terms of different regulation things that it does, fixing market failures, and not as one of the key players in the value creation process. <coughs> my position and start off with the first um, uh, and uh, ask John, I mean, you say that um, the markets for you are the, uh, I suppose we might say, the least worst way of resource allocation uh, and uh, better than the other alternatives. Um, but surely that, doesn't that depend on what the society is trying to achieve? Uh, if it's got a highly complex set of aims and objectives, then that's clearly the case that markets will do better. But if, if the aim is relatively simple or well-defined, if the aim, for example, is to uh, put a man into space or give a woman into space, um, the Soviet Union did rather well on both of those counts, actually, um, first. Um, if the aim was to reduce infant mortality, um, Cuba um, has also done, uh, did rather well on that. Uh, it was also, if the aim is to win a war, um, again, the um, Soviet Union did fairly well on that. Uh, and indeed so did the sort of socialized states of Britain uh, and even the United States at that time. <coughs> so it's a little more complex than simply saying that under all circumstances, a market will be the least worst uh, of alternatives. Yep. I mean, I think that's right. In, right. And certainly for winning wars was probably the greatest achievement of centralized planning. But that is a situation in which you really do have, for a period, a single social objective for a time. Um, putting a man on the moon or uh, building, uh, building an atomic bomb, these are things that are done well by concentrated resources, provided, and this was characteristic of both of these things, the basic elements of the technology that was deployed in order to do them were already well known. As far as reducing infant mortality is concerned, well, certainly if you adopt that as a primary social goal, you can probably achieve it. But as the example, as the country you quoted illustrates, you will achieve it at the expense of not doing great many other things at the same time. Okay. Um, right, let's go. Um, maybe that. Um, I think there are there are microphones, and I think it would be useful to. Um, Thank you. 
do, so do I take them one by one? Or I, I think take we'll, we'll take three. We'll take three questions and so as many as we can. Okay, at the back there. Yes, on the, on, on, the, on your your right hand side, on your left, your right hand side, and then on the. Thank you, Ivan Middleton. Um, you talked about the need for pro market policies. Uh, is that not going to be impossible to bring about, given the current political system, the way the political system is rent-seeking itself, uh, and the, <coughs> about the way it's dependent on established business, uh, the lobby system, the revolving door, and uh, the way parties are funded? And then, on your right. Yes, I'm going home this evening rather confused about my feelings about capitalism and about markets. What I perhaps do understand about markets is they're often in the business of producing goods that people really don't need. Uh, for instance, faster cars. We, we produce, uh, we reproduce uh, medication, which is just the revamp of old uh, products. That's going on quite a lot. Google is producing glasses where we're going to be able to walk around in a virtual world. You know, they're going to get watches out where we can look at our emails online, on our risk bar. It just goes on and on. The market produces goods we really don't need. But Professor Kay didn't really mention this. You know, is he suggesting everything's perfect in the market? It damn well isn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John. It's not perfect. So three, right. three things. Right, right. There. Well, well, I hope I can answer that last question very easily by saying I would have thought no one should go away from what I've said tonight, believing that I do think markets are perfect in the way they work. That's why I said more than once, things of the kind markets are just the least bad form of economic organization and resource allocation we have. And Right. I could, to some degree, run the argument that if people uh, want faster cars, that, that indeed is what they want. And we are both, I think, in danger of uh, uh, imposing our own preferences on, uh, on other people in a way I feel uncomfortable with. But certainly there's nothing which I've said this evening which was intended to say that because an outcome was a market outcome, it was there for a good outcome. Indeed, I have very explicitly refrained from seeing that. I'm not sure that the ownership of land has a very large influence on the, uh, the way in which our business and economic sectors operate today. I think we have a, a mess in the housing market as we have a mess in, in every other market. Uh, and I think that mess is best resolved by, as I'm suggesting for analyzing markets generally, a pragmatic and rather careful understanding of the mechanics of how that, that market operates. And then the second question, which was about, uh, can we get a better functioning market system uh, in the political environment which we now face? I would like people to go away from this evening thinking that that is one of the, the largest challenges we face. And in, in coming to terms with the realities of the market economy, which I think the political left has had to do, it has in large part been seduced by you know, a love affair with business and the people who run large business which has led to many of the undesirable consequences you, you describe. I think unless we are prepared both to recognize the, dis to recognize the distinction between pro-market and pro-business pro -business policies, to notice the degree to which our politics is being subverted by rent-seeking behavior, then I think we risk both undermining the the legitimacy of the economic system we have and inhibiting the dynamism and process of pluralism and experiment which I've decide, described as the essential characteristics of a market system. Okay, um, right at the back there. 
two in the back. Um, I was puzzled by your um, description of, of uh, capitalism being I take your point about the nature of markets and as they are, it's difficult to draw a direct line between one owner and um, the industry they work within. However, um, in thinking about um, the point about rent seeking, I wonder if that behaviour isn't because behind the scenes there is still a large wealthy elite who are inclined to uh, rent seek because they want to preserve their position. What's your view on that? So that although they may not own capital directly, they still own plenty of capital. There's plenty of wealthy people with influence. And it seems to me fairly logical they would try and preserve their wealth by any means they could. Thank you. The next one just over there. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm going here from uh, the Think Tank Policy Exchange. John, I was hoping you could answer Mariana's question about how far the state should be involved in the innovation process and how that fits in with your thesis. Right, now so a gentleman down here. Thank you. Um, speaking as a regulatory lawyer, my name is Stephen Hull. I'm interested in knowing what measures you would actually recommend to avoid the rent seeking, uh, which both your speakers seem to agree is one of the chief things that one ought to try to avoid. Do you have laws which ban it? Do you have codes and guidance which advise against it? Do you measure it compulsory to listen to lectures by economists once a year? <laughs> Economics lectures. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly in favour of that, so long as they're um, delivered by a carefully selected group of people. <laughs> um, more seriously, I think the essential thing for us to learn about the nature of regulation, uh, and financial services illustrates this well, is that regulation which is based on the detailed control of behavior almost inevitably falls victim to red seeking. And what has happened in the financial services sector is particularly in the UK, but also in some other countries, we replaced regulatory structures which focused on the structure of the industry by measures which focused, which were agnostic as to the structure of the industry and which sought to impose detailed controls of behavior. And that led to the structure of regulation which we now have in financial services, which succeeds on the one hand in being very extensive and intrusive, and on the other in being rather ineffective in achieving underlying objectives and very vulnerable to rent seeking. In other areas, such as utilities, we went in the opposite direction and replaced detailed control of behavior by structural rules with, I think, in the main, general benefit. Is there a wealthy elite uh, that is, as it were, pulling the strings behind the scenes? I think there is a wealthy elite. There is, a, uh, in some ways, in societies like Britain, a more conspicuous wealthy elite than there has been for some time. I don't think it is pulling the strings behind the scenes. I think it's pulling the strings quite publicly. Uh, and the people who are part of that elite are not people who have traditionally been wealthy, but people who have acquired their wealth as a result of the rent-seeking behavior we, we, we have been talking about. And finally, what do I think about the role of the state in the innovation process? I think the answer to that question I would give as my answer to almost every question about the role 
of the state in relation to interference in involvement in markets is a pragmatic one. That is, the role of the state should be determined by relatively detailed knowledge of the performance of a particular industry and the ways in which that market and these businesses operate. And one of the mistakes we've been making, and what I've described as the market failure doctrine, I would like to have said more about the weaknesses of that tonight, is, is the idea that we can de derive a small set of rather general rules about when uh, government should interfere in markets and when it should not. I don't think such a set of rules is available, and I think our approach generally has to be a much more pragmatic, individualized one. Mariana, would you like to comment on that? Well, I, mean, I, th I think that the reason that the market failure approach is wrong for several reasons is, first of all, that it isn't able to capture the importance of these missions, which was you know, your question. These missions, which were putting a man on the moon, but also the internet industry, I mean, the internet as a thing in itself, which was, again, as I said before, completely publicly funded, but also healthcare, you know, the NIH in the US, National Institutes of Health, spend 32 billion a year. And if you look at their website, there's a real mission there. And it's not just, as, as you say, about doing, you know, little things here and there, fixing market failures. There's, there's, you know, this big thinking, if you want. And what we lack today, and unfortunately, there's this, again, self-fulfilling prophecy. We're not allowing and not funding um, states to sort of think big. Um, and you know, putting them out on the moon, another thing that, that is important there is that we acquired like 30 different sectors actually to interact. And they actually had to be picked. I mean, also this whole worry that we have about picking winners. I mean, you know, Compaq, Intel, Apple, they were all companies that were picked. Um, the, the problem is not the picking. The problem is that then when there's a win, and the internet was a win, we actually aren't allowing the state to reap back a return because we're assuming that's just gonna happen through taxes. And even if these companies paid tax, even if they paid tax, it wouldn't come back. Because what you talk about in terms of exploration, which is very important, it's been one of the main things that I've also tried to quantify, how do we even think about this exploratory process? For every win, there's 10 losses. That's true for VC, but venture capital has a way to reap back the return. That one win, as we know, often covers, because the profits are so big, covers those nine losses. The state, we haven't allowed that. So one of the interesting things about state investment banks or different types of equity that, for example, the Scandinavian countries do keep in some of these companies, so a public funding agency, CITRA, that funded Nokia, retained equity. Or, I, I always say to government officials here, why don't we have income contingent loans for these companies? We have it for students, why not for companies? Again, when Google made billions probably even more, I don't know if they made Anyway, from this, this algorithm that the state funded, shouldn't something have been written there that if you make X billion you know, dollars, something should go back, not into the pockets of civil servants, this worry that we have of all these rent seeking also within government, but to an innovation fund that actually allowed that kind of funding to exist in the first place. And um, you know, this thing about, about picking structures, I completely agree with you. However, one of the other big insights from innovation studies is it's not a linear process. It's not what we used to think that the structure of a sector determines the conduct of the companies that then determines their performance. That's the old structure conduct performance approach. If that was true, then just focus on the structure. What we now know precisely because of the kind of things you talk about, exploratory, uh, you know, non-linear processes, self-emerging, processes, self-organization, is that it's extremely nonlinear, the structure conduct performance approach. The conduct then feeds back into the structure. The performance feeds back into the structure. So actually, you need a regulation system that understands the whole process, but then has a theory, sorry, the policy comes from the theory of how you know of, of how that happens. Okay, well, I think we'll have to um, uh, draw this to a close now, because we're supposed to finish at 8 o'clock. Um, I'm sorry, but I know there are some people waiting to ask questions, but there is an opportunity to um, uh, tackle uh, the uh, lecturer and commentator directly at the reception, uh, which we shall be uh, holding uh, in the atrium in the old <coughs> excuse me, in the atrium in the old building. Um, that's the fifth floor. Is that the fifth floor? No, it's not the fifth floor. Um, it's on the it's on the ground floor. Okay. the old building. You go a diagonally out of the out of the main entrance here into the main entrance of the old building 
and the atrium is on your right. Uh, so that is the reception that's being held. Uh, and we look forward to seeing as many of you as you can stay uh, there as possible. Um, but in the meantime, I would like to thank very much um, our uh, lecturer and our commentator. Um, we're obviously going to have to arrange for them both to compulsorily come back and uh, give us another one in the uh, another stimulating event in the near future. Thank you.